In today's video, we have a bonus episode where since the beginning of me reading out those comments from the H-Bomber Guy video, a few more stories elsewhere have popped up and some feedback from what I have written online also has popped up with some kind of odd stuff happening. So stay tuned for that. I'm going to read this all out and we'll start off with the one that most people have probably already seen off of Twitter and I've blocked out the last name of the, the lady. It's It's on Twitter so you can find it yourself. I just thought maybe maybe not post it just in case people start harassing her, but it's uh, from a girl named Laura who was in Video Games Live and was one of the main members, like a featured player in Video Games Live. And I'll play clips at the end showing what she did, but we'll read off the Twitter stuff here first. It says, I'm still thinking about this insane video and its coverage of the 2009 Brazil customs debacle. I was on that tour and one of the band members implicated in the structuring lie. If you're wondering whether that had major legal ramifications for all of us, you're correct. And what she's talking about is the story that's been shared everywhere since uh, the last year or so, where Tommy was caught trying to smuggle $100,000 out of Brazil and use the excuse that, oh, he was going to give each of the band members holding a certain amount of the money to break it up. So it's not just him holding it thinking that somehow that this would get him out of trouble. So he, as she's saying, implicated. She included all these band members who were to completely out of the loop and had no idea this was happening, which is insane because had something worse happened, especially when you're in South America, that could really impact these people's lives, you know, get a criminal record, have them stuck in Brazil. And at the time, I'm not sure her age, but she would have been early 20s, like a really young person. So just, uh, I think this is the most horrendous, well, I know I've heard other actually worse stories than this, but worst story I've heard about Tommy that's been public, I'll say that. And just, just, I don't know how anyone can defend the guy, defend the guy after hearing this story because it's 100% legit. And I'll agree with Ian in saying absolute scumbag. Like this is just scummy stuff. So... Following that up, Laura says, Friends of mine have heard me tell a story, but I have never said anything publicly until now. Because, well, why? It was just a silly clerical error in the report that we all became suspects of Homeland Security, or so I was told at the time, by the guy committing the crime. I generally try to keep my personal issues off the internet. I detest the fact that I'm even writing this right now. But I never saw those court documents until the H-Bomber Guy video last week, and they tell a very different story that I was given in 2009. No, I, I, I'm not legal expert or anything, but I wonder if the people who were on this trip could come after Tommy legally now because he, I'm not sure if it's fraud or misrepresentation or withholding stuff that could be extremely criminal against them. Just, oh, just awful stuff. She continues on by saying, I, has, I always had my suspicions that something was missing from the story, and I have learned bits of info over the years that removed some of the wool from my eyes. But I did not expect a revelation that he knowingly blatantly lied about all of us, risking our futures to save his own skin. It's difficult to unpack these memories about video games live after so many years have passed. I still have a lot of conflicting emotions surrounding that time in my life. I was very optimistic, I deeply believed in the show and the team behind it, and wanted to see it succeed. In hindsight... That's a dangerous spot to be in with a charismatic leader who has so little regard for honesty. It's incredibly easy for you, your trust to be abused repeatedly without you realizing it at first. I feel for, I feel for all of us and have had to learn the hard way. And I think a lot of the Miko cult people could read the that last little bit there and maybe they should take it in, think about it, process it. And I know what they did with uh, Tommy isn't nearly on the same level as what Tommy did to screw over these people like Laura but it's just it shows that this is this is his character he's not your friend he's not a good guy the guy is all about himself does he will do anything to protect his own self and throw everyone else under the bus no regards to people no respect for the people who helped him out got him to where he is just an, Tommy's a, a fucking horrible human being no questions about it can't defend him at all Kristen, who says, remember the Video Games Live, or sorry, remember the time when instead of paying us as guest soloists for Video Games Live, he made you split your paycheck the, that day for five ways, LOL. And Laura replied, do I, LMAO? 
So once again, not paying his his talent, but somehow being able to pocket a hundred thousand in his in his pocket in Brazil. Hmm. Interesting. He can't pay these people. So replying to that that post by Kristen, Doug says there was one show Laura split with me where I didn't even get paid. I was so excited about doing it, I didn't even realize I never got anything until way too late. Laura Laura replies. If it makes you feel any better, I wasn't paid for the very first two shows I did, and my payment for the four show Brazil tour was an iPod Touch. Like seriously, he paid someone an iPod Touch for four shows during that Brazil tour where he had a hundred thousand dollars in his pocket. Like this is, hello, amigo cultus people, DJC, Mike Mullis, Geeks of Cash, Rab, Rel Gamer, whoever else that still defends this guy. This guy had $100,000 in his pocket and he gave a featured per- performer on Video Games Live who is young in Brazil an iPod Touch. Like, how do you defend that? So, continues on, Laura says, The excitement overtakes all common sense. I was just a dumb kid fresh out of college being handed this gig on a silver platter. I didn't know any better and didn't want to jeopardize my chances for asking by asking for money. Never work without a contract, folks. VJ says, yeah, this was my mentality too. I never got paid for a single show because I just wanted to make something of it. Paid my own expenses too, except for the last show I did. He actually got me a hotel for that one. So that that also is insane. These people had to pay their own trans and their own hotel? Like, what in the world? Like, yeah, Once again, $100,000 in his pocket. It doesn't even matter the, the shows in the United States or wherever it was. The fact that these people had to pay for their own, their own hotel... And their own, like, everything? That's, this This guy is, I don't, I try and think of a, a word I can use, but, like, it's almost like he's using slave labor there. It's just, this guy is terrible. So there's not a whole lot more with within Laura's uh, Twitter, but I thought I'd play a few clips showing, so she wasn't just some background character. She was a featured performer, and I don't, I didn't look into details of how she joined Video Games Live, but from what I gathered... She did some Zelda pieces on YouTube. Tommy found her, invited her, invited her. She was so excited because young, inexperienced, took advantage of somebody's being naive and used her, basically. And try, used her to a point where she almost went to, or could have went to jail, just because he's greedy and didn't give a shit about her. So, so here's the clips of her, and then after that, I'll go to the next story. Okay, for our next story, this one is probably the most disturbing story. I'm not sure if this is true or not, but I saw it two different places recently, and it was brought up a long time ago also, so it's been around this this rumor slash story, but it comes from Toronto Van, and it says, I worked for Greedy Productions, the parent company for Electric Playground and Reviews on the Run, for a number of years. In that time, I saw some shit. 90% of the time, the host would prepare for the reviews by reading what other publications had scored it to make sure their scores weren't too far off from what other journalists gave it. Some of the time, games would be played for minutes, if at all, before giving it a score. I guess the, the exception to that would have been the Smash Brothers and how they both gave it like a 2.5. Tommy moved his younger female cousin to his house in California, and they were together for about a year. Victor and the rest of our team were well aware of the relationship but were told the show would die without Tommy, so there was nothing they could do. So when he traveled to cover games and do reviews, Greedy would cover the costs for her. Nothing criminal, obviously, but it put the crew in a really weird spot. Looking back on it years gone by, more could have been done. Well, that's pretty disturbing. So they're saying that he is 
dating his cousin, or he had dated his cousin for a year. And that's uh, that wasn't the only post that said that. Because in the H Bomber Guy video, somebody by the name of Soul of Mischief says, Little fact that remains mostly undiscovered. When Tommy was working on an electric playground in the mid-2000s, when Tommy was in his late 30s, he was dating his 19-year-old first cousin. Ask Victor Lucas about it. Well, don't ask Victor about that because he, clearly he won't say anything. And uh, he's still friends with Tommy and I'm sure he doesn't want to get involved at all. But uh, that's another person saying that he was dating his first cousin. So that's, if true, and then what I'll say if true because I don't know if it's true or not. But if true, that is absolutely disturbing. And maybe he's trying to take after his... Uh, "Quote unquote cousin Steven Tyler because uh, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of it, but Steven, when he was uh, younger in the beginning of Aerosmith, he was dating a 14 year old girl, and uh, I remember reading the stories and I'll put some screen caps there on on the screen here. But when when he was young, he somehow legally adopted or got guardianship from the parents of a 14 year old girl who was who was apparently a groupie." And took her with him on tour, so just that that is absolutely disgusting. Like I, I'm, I don't know why that's not brought up more because the guy is a grown adult and he's 14 year old girl. Like that's that's just disgusting. And it wasn't his only time because when he was in his 60s, he also was dating apparently Clint Eastwood's daughter, who was only like 18 or 19, and he was like 65. So maybe it runs in the family that they uh, quote unquote family, assuming that they're actually family. But maybe it runs in their family that they both like the, the young ladies. Because I know Tommy's wife, or possibly ex-wife, is considerably younger than him. So, uh, I just thought I'd read that out. You can be the judge if it's true or not. But if true, that's that's just disturbing. Schwartzify says, I have some unsurprising news for you. When Tommy's performing guitar live at his VGL shows, his guitar part is actually pre-recorded. It's 100% fake. Even the feedback sound you hear when he plugs in his guitar is fake. In addition, a lot of the performances are a mix with a piped-in soundtrack, so the performances vary with how real they are actually are. And his source is he's played in some VGL shows. So there's more confirmation that Tommy is not playing live, and it was quite obvious that he wasn't because just how bizarre he hams it up on stage, but I wonder if he can actually play guitar at all. That'd be interesting to find out. So this one's from the subreddit saying, from noflower4987, so back in like 2000 to 2003, Tommy was really pushing for video game music to have its own category in the Grammys as a way to legitimize the music. Arguably, arguably a good thing, right? Games are technically eligible since 1999, but none really even secured a nomination in the and other media category. So he finally gets the attention of the Grammy committee who agrees to consider some game soundtracks. After the committee is saying... They don't believe there's sufficient quantity of game soundtracks coming out each year to justify a category into itself. So what does Tommy do? He takes every soundtrack that came out in the last few years, regardless of quality, and puts them in a cardboard box and mails them to the Grammy committee. So the committee gets this loose box of 30 soundtrack CDs just kicking around with no documentation, no credit or reason for nomination, and they're like, what the fuck is this? And that's why it took another 20 years before games had their own category in the Grammys. Okay, it's one reason they stopped taking him seriously and it was in fact a bit set back for the medium everything with him is just sloppy execute it quickly throw it at the wall and see what sticks regardless of the damage done so that's an interesting story it's not uh who knows if it's true or not but it would not surprise me but uh, i would be i'm surprised that he wouldn't have just sent his own soundtracks to the grammy community the best of tommy Tallarico or whatnot but Okay, for the next little bit, uh, I saw this on the subreddit today, and it's from uh, Emilio Estevez's stash, and he noticed that in Tommy's house tour that he had a couple of years back with the, the same one where the guy was shown the Guinness Book of Records and where the floor was really dirty, but he posted this little clip here, and I never noticed this when I've watched this video, and it's only only watched it a few times, but you'll see on the floor... They have uh, puppy pads, you know, for their dog. And it's just absolutely littered with urine and there's some crap on there too. But if you look closely, and it's kind of hard to see behind the piano, but the, everything is covered in piss on the right behind the piano. And there's like four or five piss stains on the, on the right-hand part of the, the pads. 
That is uh, that's incredibly weird, especially because for many reasons. First of all, he works from home, so why wouldn't he take his dog outside to go to the bathroom? And usually people who lay pads like that, that's, that's, that's for lazy people who don't want to do the work. And second of all, the, I guess the bigger thing is he, he knows he's having a house tour with his neighbor here. You think he would clean it up beforehand? <laughs> like, there's no shame in having this, in like how much it would smell also. I can only imagine how bad it smelled with like six or eight piss stains in there. It's just, I don't know. I just, I found it to be very odd. And I, I can't remember if he is married at this point or not, but his wife is like an animal lover or a vet or something like that. And most, most vets would not recommend even using puppy pads. It's like it's only used, usually you only use it for emergency case scenarios. So just, I just thought I'd show this clip because I thought it was disgusting. And I thought you guys would find it pretty interesting too. So, yikes. I could, I could only imagine how, ba how bad it smelled in there. It's what came from that. So, yeah. Really and have you always been a classical music guy? Uh, or, no, rock and roll, really. Yeah. You know, uh, you know my uh, cousins, Steven Tyler from Aerosmith. Mr. Clone985 wrote, and I uh, apologize for the bad grammar here, even though he edited this, it says, This is amazing. Just remember me the movie Coco where all the trauma is about to people stealing achievements and letting the original one just pass away as a fraud or even forgotten about, as the movie uses the brilliant way. I think what he's trying to say is, in the movie Coco, it's very similar to Tommy Tallarico where he steals somebody else's uh, music and then everyone forgets about the guy, the original, like the guy who wrote the music, and he fades away into obscurity. So maybe it's the similarity between Joey Curras and Tom, Tommy and doing the same thing. So I, I like it. This was one of the actually really good ones that not too many people were talking about, but it's from Jamie Scott, who is a professional in the gaming industry, and I'll put his list of credits on the screen here. He says, this was just brilliant. TT isn't a top worth, topic worthy of this kind of journalistic masterwork, but I'm so grateful that you guys did it. Those of us who have been in the game audio industry since the 90s have always known this guy as a massive snake oil salesman, but now the hard facts are out there thanks to you. Bravo. So there you go. One of his peers, well aware of uh, Tommy and who he is, agreeing that the guy is a fraud. And uh, I'm, I'd, I'm, it'd be so interesting to hear from other people in the industry who does audio what they think of Tommy, and more, more so the guys that's been that were around from the '90s to the early aughts. I'd, I'd love to hear more stories about him. So for the next story we have, this is a long one, so I apologize in advance, and I'm, I'll probably skip a few parts because there's just so much words and so much wordiness that this one person had wrote that I just don't want to bore everyone to death but a couple weeks ago on the subreddit somebody had it has taken issue with one of my shorts I had uploaded I had uploaded a short video basically showing the clip of Scott Baird in the comment section of the H Bomber guy video showing that he was present during the recording of the oof and talked about how a girl hit herself in the stomach and how she made the oof noise and he was present Verifying that, yes, indeed, Tommy was at least present in the room when the oof sound was created. I had doubts on this. I don't believe that this story is true. And that was my opinion. And somebody on Reddit here with the name of Cloud Appropriate said, Ninja, you were one of my two favorite personalities documenting the whole Amico debacle. I have to say that out front because the second comment is more about my personal disappointments than anything else. It's common for YouTubers who are trying to grow their channel to use titles that are designed to attract people's attention. Your short is called The Oof Sound Was Made By A Little Girl Punching Herself. As Gay Ruse points out in his comments on your video, Scott states that the sound they captured was based on a f her spoken oof, not her motions that were like a kitten swatting themselves, which sounds far from a punch. I never would have pegged the kind of guy who would stoop to the bottom feeder ways to promote a video. I hope you aren't. And I thought that was kind of odd because uh, mostly I wrote that in jest because that's what it, it basically, that's what it said in the comment. So clearly, I, no, I didn't think that this girl actually punched herself hard in the stomach. And the reason I wrote that title is because just of the ridiculousness of that notion that a six-year-old girl would hit herself in the stomach to make the oof noise. 
and just the whole story behind it. If you watch the video or read the comment, it, it just it just seems extremely weird. So of course I'm making fun of it. And anyways, I responded. I said the point of the title is the ridiculous story that the guy gave about getting the sound file. I really doubt a six-year-old would punch herself in the stomach in order to get a sound file for an extremely unimportant part of the game. So basically, what I just said. Cloud appropriate response to say a story is ridiculous is to call him a liar with no evidence to back it up. There's so much cognitive bias going on that Barrett has no way to defend himself because it's likely that people assume he is lying whatever he says. Am I making an assumption with no basis? If I'm not, how could he defend his reputation in a way that would satisfy you? And at this point, I something seems a bit off and it doesn't really make sense. Like, why would someone go out of their way? Because this is not even a, what a typical uh, a fan of Tommy or the Amico would, would write. This seems... So random that some random person would just go out of their way to say this stuff. So I had responded, I'm a gambling man and I like to play the odds. Tommy and his associates have lied basically 99% of the time. So I'm going to assume it's a lie. The odds of someone being able to fondly recollect recording a single sound effect from 20 years ago on a game at the time which wasn't a big deal is extremely unlikely. I go by what Judge Judy always says. If it doesn't make logical sense, then it's a lie. I can't remember what her exact phrasing is. But she used to always say that, saying, if it doesn't make sense, it's not the truth. And the whole story that Scott had written out, it just doesn't seem to make sense. Like, it doesn't... Like, why would someone remember a small sound effect from 20 years ago? And why would they go through all this? Was, this isn't an iconic sound effect, like Mario doing his jump, or an important di like line of dialogue for a game. This is just a random throwaway sound effect. So Cloud responds, he says in his comment that everyone at the, was at the session... Okay, sorry. He says in his comment that everyone at the session, including the guy who played God, was amused by her attempt at a read. By that logic, in 20 years, you won't remember cute things your daughter did when she was six. You may argue that there's a difference because it is your own child. Fair enough. Do you remember any funny work stories from 20 years ago? I'll assume not, but just because you're incapable doesn't mean that he is. How exactly are you defining associate? This definition is the linchpin of your argument, but also assumes you know the details of Scott and Tommy's relationship over two decades. I assume you have that info. Do tell! And again, what could Scott do to defend himself against the accusation that he's lied? I don't expect you to have an answer at this point. Like, so when he wrote, how exactly are you defining associate? Well, the fact that he's a developer for one of the games on the Amico shows he has a financial interest in the success of the console. And he also was the producer on several intelligent Amico videos. I'm not sure if it was only the Bomb Squad ones or other ones. He does have a vested interest because... Like it or not, the Miko is so closely tied with Tommy Tallarico that any negativity that Tommy brings to light to the, the general public will impact people's opinions on the Amico, which then would affect sales. And less console sales equals less revenue, potential revenue from Bomb Squad. So that's why I say he has a vested interest and he's an associate, business associate. And from what I've read, they've been working together since Electric Playground days, so I'm not sure if they're friends or not off, out of work, but they definitely have an association. So I replied saying, you're assuming his story is true and that he isn't fabricating and completely to help his friend out. When 99% of Tommy's stories have been proven to be lies and his friends also have covered and either lied themselves or went along with Tom's lies, why would anyone believe Scott is telling the truth? So this, once again, random Reddit person says, you're accusing someone of being a liar with no evidence, just your own assumptions. And I'm not going to read all the stuff here because this is ridiculous. So you can you can pause it and read the three things about having to prove someone's telling the truth or not. I did f find it funny at the bottom. He says, when Retro Bro took off his Tommy colored glasses, he said, I've discovered the Miko side is just as toxic as the anti side. I guess we could say it's true here that a few people want so much of their beliefs about Scott Barrett to be true that all rational adult thought goes out the window. So it's really... Really odd that a random Reddit f person is coming up to bat so much to defend the honor of Scott Barrett. So it's not like that a lot of people are talking about Scott Barrett and his name is being smeared similar to Tommy. I had just brought up the video and Scott said what he said and I just disagree with what he had said in saying that he was present and saying that Tommy is telling the truth. I just, my personal opinion based off of just logic is that it's not the truth and he's just covering for a friend so it's very odd that a random redditor would defend this guy's honor so much magically i got a response from ihq devs who thanks cloud appropriate for defending my honor his honor and it reveals that this is who 
that he is Scott Barrett and he's using this different account because he had doxed his original account. And I'll let you read this. You can pause it if you want to read everything because he does write a whole lot. Very similar to the cloud appropriate. A lot of very wordy. So basically what he had said is that Tommy is a narcissist. And just because Tommy was in the room doesn't mean he created the oof sound. But it also doesn't mean that he wasn't around when it was created. He also talks about how he likes H-Bomber guy's video and how extremely well done it was. Blah, blah, blah. Because he's he just... You can pause, like once again, you can pause and read all this stuff. So one thing I want to read out here is it says, It's now been a year since we've talked. When he withdrew, he did so just beyond the internet. Beyond just the internet. So I have no information about how he's taking any of this or if he's doing okay. Anytime I reach out, he has met with silence. And that's very interesting because Tommy's still the chief creative officer. Like he's still involved in one of the main, if not the main investor or for the for the ownership. And he hasn't talked with the Bomb Squad developer, and Bomb Squad was one of the few games that actually did get traction where people were interested in playing. It's one of the more interesting and unique experiences or games. So what is going on with Intelligent? That is very bizarre that we hear now a second developer who hasn't heard anything from Intelligent because last time was Mike Mika or Micah. So very, very interesting that this information was revealed. And so, I'll, like I said, you can read the rest yourself. But he says he's texted Joey, Joey Caress, and he doesn't want to get involved with anything. I don't blame Joey. And that he's also talked with the girl that was involved and that he recommended that she probably shouldn't, you know, unveil herself. And I also don't, I don't know, Scott makes a scene, like he says that this is like a big, huge mystery and that it's like uh, Bigfoot sightings and people want to know where did Oof came from. And I don't think really people give much of a care where the oof came from. I think the bigger deal is the fact that Tommy Dalrico was trying to get a whole bunch of, like a big payday out of Roblox, even though he wasn't the one who actually created the sound. That's the that's the story. I don't think anyone really cares about how the sound originated. And getting back to the original comments, I just didn't think the story made sense. Like In my previous video, I had audio engineers say that they don't even remember what they recorded the week before. So why would people remember the specific sound from 20 years ago that it's it's not significant it's just one random sound effect it just it doesn't make sense so i had replied saying once again as a business partner you would have something to gain if tommy was proven to be correct and if somehow the overwhelming tidal wave of bad attention he attracted could be dissipated on the same note many folks are emotionally invested in the downfall of tommy so a lot of preconceived bias against him is also at play as a kid in Indian myself it is my duty to not lie because that's what he said in the last thing Therefore, I can simply call it based on history and logic. Also, I'm not invested in this financially or emotionally. I'm mostly attracted because of the train wreck aspect of it. The story seems far-fetched, as does every other story involving Tommy Tallarico and Intelligent Miko. Seems to always be smoke and mirrors and nowhere normal at all. And then I said, at this point, I'm almost unsure if Scott Baird is sentient AI and Bomb Squad was just some random AI-generated videos and that none of this is real at all. Well, maybe that was sarcasm, but you get the point. And I just wrote that just to be nice because I don't have anything against Scott. Like, I thought the game was one of the the decent, like one of the few games that actually made sense on the system. And I did get one more message after it. Holy jeez, the massive thing once again. I'll let you read because I just I can't, I just can't. And it says Ninja. This is from Cloud Appropriate again. I appreciate you responding to IHQ devs who basically said he doesn't give a shit about what you've said here in your video and hopes that I can remain a fan of yours, but that ain't happening. And so then he, this guy goes off again and he talks about how Scott develops really high. He gives a the video link of Scott's previous game he worked on that had excellent reviews and just saying how Scott is a reliable guy, good guy. And once again, you can pause it, read it yourself. I'm just going to say, I thought this was a really weird in encounter. I, I haven't had this because most people, most of the haters are the, not haters, most of the Amico fans who were not happy in my videos are pretty direct and just say, hey, I don't agree with you saying, or you're, you suck or whatever. They don't write paragraph long or stories just to defend the honor of somebody else that's unrelated to them. So I'm assuming this was Scott with two different accounts because that's, once again, the only thing that makes sense to me. And I don't know. I don't know what to say. i sorry if I hurt his feelings and if he doesn't agree. But this is what happens when you get in. I'm not saying get in bed. But this is what happens when you associate with Tommy. 
Tommy stink rubs off on you. And that's why people distance themselves from Tommy because they don't want to get caught in the same bubble as him because Tommy has such a bad rep with everything that's happened that you will get lumped in with him. So not saying you can't defend a friend and, and maybe maybe Tommy was present during the oof thing. It just seems very not very logical. So I'd asked a few people and they said they said, Oh, they think it's different people. I disagree. I think it's the same guy. So it was brought to my attention. Apparently somebody a year ago on the Ars Tetica forums, right around the time when Tommy was uh, threatening legal action or legal incoming to Sam Makovec and Ars Tetica because they published that article. On the forums, somebody by the name of IG Dev. Now, that seems very similar to what we uh, just saw a couple seconds ago with that other, uh, with Scott Barrett. And this person, we're not saying it's Scott, but who knows, had started posting very long, very similar, you know, novel-like posts about not being pro Miko, but trying to be the devil's advocate and trying to push the Miko narrative so people weren't so one-sided. And I thought it'd be interesting just to look at a couple of those posts. So his first one, and I'm not going to read everything because he posts, it's just like what I just showed you. There's so many long-winded winded posts that kept going into circles that it just make your head spin. So it's a very similar writing style is all I'm saying. So his first post on the, the forums, and at that point on the forums, everyone was just like everywhere else saying, this is doomed, can't believe how terrible the Miko is, everything doesn't make sense, Tommy is crazy, all that stuff. He says, 10% facts plus 20% speculation plus 70% half-truths, aka 70% half-lies, is the composition of this article. It could have made the point in one-third of the words, I'm guessing there's a quota tied to article submission length to support the ads. I just googled Amico Kickstarter and Amico Crowdsource got zero hits. I dug some more and do see that they are on the Republic, which is an investment vehicle, not really crowdsource, like the tagline would lead one to believe. Doctored photos? Not good, period. They would have done better to just get real people using the controllers for still photos. But this is Ars Tetica, not Ars Advertisica, so please stay with the tech angle, unless again, you have a word quota to hit. Kind of condescending there, kind of weird that someone who's a fan, like, you're on the Ars Technica forums, why would you be trashing Ars Technica? Very bizarre. Why bash the controllers instead of the 8-way D-pad? There are 16 or something on the Amico. Plus, it supports rolling. Rolling seems like a good idea. My mom tried some stuff on the Xbox, tried to roll her thumb across the D-pad with bad effect. Maybe Amico has a good idea there. Why not call that out as an innovation instead of bashing it because it's not like everything else. Why focus on the negative Wii U side of things? I saw part of the E3 demo showing someone shaking dice on the controller and then virtually throwing the dice onto the TV. That seems like a cool idea. Why not mention the innovation like that? Doing a card game or football game picking receiver routes on your own controller seems like a good idea, actually. It looks like COVID-19 supply chain problems are hurting the startup much more than it would hurt the big three companies. Mostly because the startup is not as... is not he big, I guess you mean not as big as the three companies. They have to get their silicone from overseas like everyone else. Why wouldn't you mention that And when it's basically been in non-tech news for a very long time? I can make wild guess that a brand new controller takes 20 iterations and the factory turnaround is 6 weeks per and now 12 weeks per due to pandemic. That adds to the time. Then all of the other stuff that's not the controller seems like it would hurt a release date. Imagine that the demos are limited because no one can get the actual hardware. Microsoft and Sony and Nintendo have been impacted, we know. It's probably crushing this little company. Are crushing to this little company. A lockdown on patch support also means online multiplayer and Amico would be inherently difficult to support since online modes tend to expose issues like character balance and cheat exploits. This does not strike me as an online multiplayer console at all. The Amico promo stuff I saw talked about in-person games, not once about multiplayer online, multi-online play. Why make a detracting comment in the article about something the console is not made to do? If the Amico makes phone class games instead of the Xbox class games, and they are instant pick up and play on a TV for multiple people to enjoy, and they can get them to the 95 95% of the Earth's population that doesn't play or can't afford PS, Xbox, Switch, then they have a win. And if you, as you can see at the bottom, it has a negative 36 for the you know plus or minuses on the actual posts. A whole bunch of people commented. I'm not going to read out everything because that would take hours. 
But basically, lots of people were just saying, what the heck are you talking about? And pointed out all the tons of facts going against what he's just saying there. So this IG dev then says, I usually skim through the articles because the content is good. Stuff I didn't know. There's some stuff I didn't know on this particular topic. Then after reading through this one, it seemed to be so slanted with a lot of negative circular replies that I figured that I could chime in with a point of view that wasn't the same echo chamber. So here goes. I just created an account so I could write and not just read. If this was an old school call-in radio show, I'd say long time, first time. Anyways, here it goes. It looks to me like the Switch has become a fairly complicated lift for an audience that wants to pick up and play. I think the a scenario, I think the scenario the Amico addresses is the family is coming together for a barbecue. And it's getting late. And people are coming inside and it's time to play a game and two people pick up controllers and another four people pull out their phones and they all play something in front of the same TV and have the fun. The console is 250 and the game is $10. I don't know about the Switch economics, but wouldn't that be at a higher cost for a family to do a similar thing? This seems like the thing... The Wii excelled at when it was new. The only game my family played on it was the Wii Sports, super simple to learn, and stuff my mom actually tried it. It seems like the Mikos trying to do the same thing. The Switch seems to be more sophisticated. Another idea, what if the Mikos can go into bars and restaurants and stuff? Play a card game or snake game or something on a big screen against other people with your phone. <laughs> I had to stop there. <laughs> Why? Wouldn't it be easier to play a card game at the bar by just, you know, opening up a pack of playing cards? That's just... Seems a lot easier in my opinion. Nobody will trash their own phone as a controller. Handing out a bunch of switches in a public setting like that might be asking for a lot of tech overhead as opposed to download this app and play. On some game with little to no instructions needed, I think that would be expensive and or complicated on a switch. That one also got negative 9, negative 10. And uh, that's it. This seems very similar to the talking points that Tommy always had mentioned. And his name is IG Dev, and later on, he does admit he's a developer, so if he's at all in tune with the gaming industry, he would know the answers of how much the Switch costs and how you can buy third-party controllers. Just, uh, I, I, I could go in on this for so long, but I won't because there's so many more. This guy posts so many more things that were just long-winded, so we'll continue on with that. So he wrote... I thought they hired marketing people that used to work for Nintendo. I would expect them to know how to market this enough to make critical mass to sell them. I can't imagine they had to sell them at Xbox-like numbers to be successful. If there are 2 to 3 million consoles sold with n number of games that people like, I think that would make it a success. Having been on Windows forever, I can say it's easy to get lost in a sea of similar titles and never get recognition. The Miko idea reminds me of what the iPhone was when it first came out. It was a highly curated and limited library with a fixed set of design goals. If the television folks... Follow the same, maybe lightning can strike twice. Industry articles plus experts hated the iPhone idea in 2007. But back to the actual tech parts. It seems like we need to see more actual play from Intellivision. Until then, whether the Snapdragon can do it or not is the actual interesting stuff. The rest is just food for trolls. It would be cool if the article said, here's what we know from the leaks. And from my research on similar hardware shows, this. And they use a name, another hardware platform. They could do that and etc. etc. Doing some creative extrapolation. That is what I want from Ars Technica. I can go on YouTube, Twitter if I just want to see negativity. Ooh. So I'll skip over what a bunch of other people, and he did say some more smaller things that's not worth mentioning, but uh, as you can see on this screen here, it says, I'm imagining a family walking into a venue of some kind, big restaurant, and has a big screen monitor TV attached. It seems like a barrier of entry or pretty low for the public venue to have a QR code for the Miko controller app, have staff with minimal tech skill to start the console, keep the console out of reach of the public, and maybe power cycling it for anyone who wants to play each time to keep it simple for busy staff and letting people play games that are supposed to supposed to not need serious instructions or a lot of USA culture knowledge to play. And I won't go through the rest of the points. You can pause it and read the screen here. But that what an insane idea. He, so he's saying that restaurants would have the Amico and people can play at the table. Why the hell would they do that? Because first of all, those controllers would get stolen. They don't. There's a million reasons why they wouldn't do this. It makes no sense. Most tables, most restaurants want to turn tables fast they don't want people staying longer they want people to come in eat leave new people come in eat leave they make more money they don't want people lounging around and if they did want something with lounging they wouldn't have the miko they would have arcades or something else which is significantly easier and more and it's something they can actually generate revenue on so it sounds like this guy is using some pretty far-fetched ideas and if you notice the writing style just going into great detail 
So in this in this screen here, somebody had rural ninja had said it's not me, different ninja apparently. That he's just talking about how why would developers want to be exclusive on the Miko on a platform with such a small limited uh, audience and where they can't you know go third party to different places and make more money. And IG Devs here says if I am a developer with a pretty successful quick to play game on Android and need two months three months of code base changes to run on the Miko, have to add tweak something so there is exclusive features on the platform. If I read the fine print correctly and I have access to 100,000 potential buyers, taking a swag that a million consoles sold will have 10% of it interested in a given game and net $5 per sale, that seems to be pretty good, especially if I have no platform competition because of curation. So if I can sell Finnegan Fox, but a competitor can sell Funnigan Fish, it seems like using the established older pick your descriptor Snapdragon platform in the gigantic Android dev base was a good move. You'll have to get the dev kits right and market the dev story, but this looks extending the promise of the Unity and Android platform size matters. Maybe your implied point is that the intelligence has to increase the dev's percentage per game sold because the Amigo has to shine to attract devs. Seems like they should give it a, give the first end devs like 90% in order to grow that game's list. Minus 8 is what he got rated there. And then John Carter had said, This has been a very entertaining and informi- informative discussion. I can't wait for the reappearance of Talarico. Oh, crossed out IG dev. And then he writes, more than one person can think that Amico could sell with all of us being Tommy Tallarico. And uh, I don't think it's Tommy Tallarico because Tommy would be swearing and calling Sam, calling out Sam directly and bitching at him nonstop. So after some banter between people, mostly people just crapping on him, pointing, using all the facts to say that what he's saying was incorrect or just saying what he's saying is, you know, a cl- pie in the sky idea. Sam read which is Sam from Arstatica, says, you created this account only after this article went live. Named yourself IG Dev, and have only replied to an otherwise dormant feature, arguably to bump it in the RS form interface. Would you like to identify yourself at this point, or at least clarify your relationship with the current incarnation of Intellivision? I ask this in particular because nobody has mentioned ADA friendliness until your latest topic bump, and Amico's lack of clear buttons on the top of its pad, only a touchscreen, isn't necessarily ideal for existing accessibility rigs that revolve around discrete buttons. If anything, the auto arrangement of shoulder buttons make it such a rig even harder to firm up, so it's required bracing at multiple angles. You may have, you may very well be in a position to answer that concern on Intelligence's behalf, and if so, please go right ahead. So I guess what had happened is IG Dev was bumping the thread continuously trying to get people to respond, and Sam had enough and just wanted to know, hey, who are you? So he had responded to Sam by saying, there's no Miko conspiracy going on. I'm not sure what you mean by bump up in the artist's interface. Not looking for glory, just interested in some good debate on what can work on this thing or not. Like I posted before, I usually skim ours for the technical infos when this topic went off the rails with something where I can think I can have some input. It seems like a good place time to get into it. Looks like trying to buck the group thing here was a mistake on my part. Anyways, I mentioned the controller because it seems like it'd be easier to handle compared to popular controller configs. And then list the three big ones. For someone on a special needs skill, I can't do anything on Intellivision's behalf any more than you can. There are lots of grades of ability, but my point is that something with less controls like a disc and a touchscreen and shoulder buttons could be easier to hand, handle than something with small buttons on a tight layout. Special needs aside, it resembles the phone, phone form factor and also could be, should be less intimidating for someone like my mom who didn't grow up with video games. And then he says, my username is Variant Mash of my name, not Intelligent Game Developer. If I worked for Intelligent, wouldn't that be the world's dumbest name to have on here to talk about an Intelligent article? You've made some good points about stuff. You can probably keep going without jumping to conspiracy theory. I guess on the restaurant, I, I'm not going to read the rest of the crap there, but Marcellus, or Marcellus has says, on the contrary, it'd be a great name to use if, if one was to present themselves as an official representative of intelligent and be able to talk about the console and the company from a position of authority and experience for someone trying to hide their connection to an intelligent yes it's the world's dumbest name regarding the rest of your post you're just arguing in circles you're not addressing any of the actual concerns or issues others have brought up and just repeat how neat you think your ideas are damn everyone else for not seeing the same it's not worth arguing with you anymore because you're not bringing anything any thought or substance to in the discussion and sam had responded then you don't skim the site as much as you allege, because that's fine. I mean, at this point, whoever you are, you've posted a lot about one topic and one topic only and have in time exhausted any sense that we might have expect reasonable debate, insight, or good faith acknowledgement of others' views on the topic going forward. I'm hopeful you redirect your energy at this point 
And I encourage you to, among other things, educate yourself on what accessibility in game controllers means. You can start with two pieces I wrote about a very good Xbox solution to the sector. Post two links and says, take care. And from that point on, he disappears. He doesn't come back. So I'm sorry that this video has been long-winded and kind of boring. But I just thought, this is my opinion. Clearly, I don't have facts. Clearly, I don't have video evidence of this. But it appears that Scott Barrett is one of the guys that drank the Kool-Aid. So as in believing the hype of, oh, this is going to sell a million units. And I assume he's going on damage control, both in this Ars Tactica article, which is from a year ago, you know, trying to protect the Amico. And I also assume from like a week or two ago when I posted the video saying that, basically saying that I don't believe he's telling the truth about Tommy. So clearly something is going on. I assume he's just personally, like he took it to heart when I said that stuff. And I apologize if it upsets him. But that's based off everything I've read, seen, everything we've been exposed to. There's no reason at all we should believe anything. And I'm under the impression that this IG dev on the Ars Tactica thing is the same guy. And he's pretending to not be somebody associated with intelligence. So it is my opinion that possibly Scott might lie. So maybe he's also lying about the story of the oof. Just, you know, to defend his friend and former business associate Tommy. It's not the end of the world. Like, I'm not going to say everyone should come after this guy and should be a witch hunt or anything like that. But just, I just got to call it as it is. Maybe I am completely wrong. Write in the comments, people. Maybe I am just looking way too much into it. And it's just a weird coincidence that a guy named IG Dev writes long novels and talks in circles. So does IHQ Devs. And so is this other, whatever the hell the other guy's name on Reddit. They all have the same writing style. All really go in on defending something that really there's no, there's no point in defending. Maybe it's just me. What do you think? Let me know. Write in the comments. I'm sorry that this video took so long, but until the next one, have a good one.